Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. You daily dive into the news, and we got a lot to talk about today. Some big, some small, unfortunately, some very meaningful. So how about you just hit that like button, make sure you're subscribed, and let's jump into it. This is a new show. So many of you already know this. YouTube has had a bot problem for years, but now the problem's starting to evolve from annoying to illegal. We're seeing creators now being spammed left and right with comments advertising links to alleged CP on their videos. And seemingly as more people have become aware of this, they're speaking out. With, for example, Mudahar of Some Ordinary Gamers sharing an example. These people, you know, basically tell the comment section, hey, my illegal material videos are more entertaining than this slop. Click the link in my channel to watch them, okay? So then you go to their actual account, and the problem here is they actually have Discord links right here. So obviously I'm blurring the Discord link because first off, if they're openly advertising that their Discord contains illegal material, then uh, you know it's not ever worth clicking on their Discord to verify the illegal material. They've already said that they're distributing illegal stuff. You know, Mudahar possibly making this video because in recent days, a lot of fans have been noticing this trend, with then some even going further, blaming the creators themselves for, quote, allowing this to happen. With that, you had Mudahar responding. So one of the actual Reddit posts that I saw where one person wrote, creators are too busy counting their money to give a shit what happens in their comments. Like, dog, I don't know what you want people to do. Do you want us to upload a video and then like start looking through every single comment section and moderating it? I use about as much of the YouTube auto moderation tools as I can. I have no time out of my day and no other creator that I know has time in their day to auto mod their comment section. Right, and he then goes on to say that this problem is one that YouTube itself needs to address. And he's been by no means the only one speaking out. You had Moist Critical, for example, also chiming into the conversation, saying that even with YouTube's current tools for moderating comments, there really isn't anything creators can do to fully stop this. No one likes to see their comment section end up in this kind of state especially not when it's promoting awful, awful things. Like, nobody wants that. I use all of the automated tools YouTube offers to try and put the kibosh on this garbage here. Most YouTubers do. But sometimes it's just not enough because it's so easy to make a ton of bots, even going through manually and deleting each and every comment from bots, you'll still have more bots that could show up later because it's like a Hydra. You cut off one head and five take its place. With them also going on to say that, you know, this isn't going to be solved until YouTube steps in. Though there, you have others noting that YouTube's kind of always been playing a game of whack-a-mole. Right? Like when similar issues popped up in the past and gained the spotlight, YouTube in response disabled comments on videos featuring kids. Also last year, YouTube actually banned links and shorts comments, but like Mudahar showed in that first example, spam accounts are now redirecting people to links in their bios anyway. And actually, you know, the issue of bots spamming comments, it goes even further than what we've been talking about. For example, back in April, Forbes actually published an article finding over 100 videos with millions of views advertising AI apps and websites that could remove clothes from images. Also, they found another two dozen ads on Google promoting the same thing, with one even seemingly advertising it for babies. With it reportedly not until Forbes reached out to Google and YouTube that they actually took all this down. And you have to wonder, with the continued advancement of AI every single day and the, the barrier for entry to use those tools for good and bad, can a YouTuber, really any platform, get ahead of these things? Right? They're successful, they seemingly have have the resources, but also do they? The scale of this website is insane. And seemingly the bad actors use that to their advantage. Whenever they're stopped, they find a way around. But yeah, hopefully we see advancements from YouTube and then also at the very least, uh, do not blame YouTubers for what's happening. Right? No one wants that dumpster fire happening. But then switching gears, let's talk about some quickie news. Starting with, you know, there's so much news out there right now about the presidency. How does a Mr. Beast presidency sound to you? Because the conversation around that future, it kicked off online this week after Jimmy tweeted, if we lower the age to run for president, I'll jump in the race. Well, the tweet alone generated a ton of headlines and responses. It was the follow-up that got even more attention. Because this morning he added, I wouldn't care about party lines. I just always truly make the American people my number one priority. For problems I'm ignorant in, I'd have experts from the left and right advise me on them and try to find the best middle ground that's best for America. Wouldn't be viable, don't care about doing things just because my party says I should and I would focus on uniting the country instead of dividing. While well, a lot of people are like, oh my God, I'd absolutely love that. Which you know is not surprising for a guy that just passed 300 million subscribers. That's a lot of fans, that's a lot of support. Personally, I'm just, I'm so fascinated by this prospect. Like I would love if legitimate pollsters did a poll around this. Like would you support Mr. Beast 
for president, if he could run right now or in the future. And then let's say we fast forward 15 years and we run the polls, but after he announces he's running and he actually says what he supports. Cause there's like three to five things minimum that you're gonna lose 40% of the possible support you could get just by having an opinion. Or like in no way does Jimmy need to answer this question now. It is a personal opinion of his. Or at some point he'll have to have an official stance on abortion access. No matter the answer, a meaningful amount of support out the window. And again, that's just one. And this is not me specifically singling out Jimmy. I'm bringing this up because it was a thing that was said over the weekend. But it is something I wonder about every time someone says, you know, a Mr. Beast or The Rock or, you know, some celebrity, they should run because everyone loves them. But like, how often do you realize that we like people that we know almost nothing about? You know, that could be healthy. Not everyone has to be like just fucking slinging their opinions left and right. But when you become a politician and you can affect what's legal or not legal, yeah, the opinions matter. They have to come out. That said, I'm also interested in the prospect of, of Jimmy 16 years from now having an AOC do an obstacle course to see if we can all get universal health care. But then, in more quickie serious news, Alec Baldwin's trial is currently underway for his involvement in the fatal shooting on the set of Russ. He's pleading not guilty to involuntary manslaughter charges. A jury was just selected yesterday and opening statements took off today. And there, we saw prosecutors arguing that Baldwin was reckless and showed no regard for safety protocols. When someone plays make believe with a real gun in a real life workplace and while playing make-believe with that gun violates the cardinal rules of firearm safety people's lives are endangered and someone could be killed. With them saying that while the trial will often refer to the weapon as a prop gun, it was a real gun. She also brought up Baldwin's prior claims that he never pulled the trigger, saying that's just not possible, and then adding that he was responsible for numerous firearm safety breaches. But then, as far as the defense goes, they're arguing that Baldwin, he's just an actor and he's not in charge of firearm safety. That was the duty of other people. This was an unspeakable tragedy, but Alec Baldwin committed no crime. He was an actor acting, playing the role of Harlan Rust. An actor playing a character can act in ways that are lethal, that just aren't lethal on a movie set. These cardinal rules, they're not cardinal rules on a movie set. Safety is ensured before the actor. And they are saying the people in charge of firearm safety, they should have had dummies on set, not real bullets. But I'm also notably saying that Baldwin was told the gun was safe to use. And that, of course, as the film's armor has already been found guilty and sentenced to 18 months for involuntary manslaughter. Which also on that note, if Baldwin is convicted, he could likewise spend 18 months behind bars and face a $5,000 fine. And then so we need to talk about Joe Biden and why you're currently seeing headlines like before Biden can save Ukraine, he must use the NATO summit to save himself. With then also everyone from the likes of Fox News framing it as a make or break moment for Biden to the Associated Press describing it as an opportunity for him to quote, reset his stumbling campaign. And all of this as if you go online right now, it's hard to know what's real or not. Right? There are real things like Michael Bennett becoming the first Democratic Senator to publicly question Biden's candidacy. And you've had the likes of Democratic Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill becoming the ninth House Democrat to call for Biden to drop out of the race. But then, you I mean, you've got the likes of the Bezos bugle, right? The folks of the Washington Post reporting California Congressman Ted Lieu, the vice chair of the Democratic caucus said on a House Democratic call that President Biden should not seek re-election. Right? making him the highest ranking House Democrat to call on Biden to step aside from his campaign. With then Ted Lieu himself responding to a post by Yashar Ali going, hey, great picture of me with Biden. This is false. With then actually Ted Lieu using the attention to say this to reporters. We hear a lot from our constituents on different issues, but something I've heard that doesn't seem to be being covered are the Epstein files. These files were released and like Donald Trump's sort of all over this, right? There are pictures of him with Jeffrey Epstein. He's taking multiple plane flights with Epstein with young girls on board. Uh, he is in call logs with Epstein. One of the highest trending hashtags on t Twitter right now is about Trump and Epstein. I'm not gonna repeat the hashtag because we're in a dignified setting, but yeah, y'all might want to look at that because that's highly disturbing. And again, it shows that Donald Trump is unfit for office. And by the way, he was convicted in a civilian court for sexual assault convicted in a separate court of 34 felonies. Donald Trump should drop out of the race. And then I mean, just this morning, right before I started shooting this show, I saw MSNBC, the, the outlet that you'd think is probably the most pro Biden out there. They posted moments ago, Democratic Senator Blumenthal, quote, I am deeply concerned about President Biden. Right, you see that and you go, holy shit, this is huge. But then when you watch the full clip, it is hard to see it as anything other than, at the very least, a wildly irresponsible shortening of that quote that changes the entire narrative. Or at the very worst, an attempt to mislead the public. I am deeply concerned about Joe Biden winning this November because it is an existential threat to the country if Donald Trump wins. So 
I think that we have to reach a conclusion as soon as possible. And I think Joe Biden, as the Democratic nominee, has my support. Right, that is a wildly different statement. Right? And so with all of that, I, I want to say two things. One, I'm not dismissing your concerns if you're concerned about Biden's age and his performance, right? especially after that shit show of a debate. But also at the same time, I want you to consider that there is what could be described by some as a concerted effort, not an all-encompassing, but a decent effort from those in corporate media to take Biden out. And that for a wide range of reasons. Right? Some wanna push him out as the nominee and they wanna use their position to try to foster that. Whereas others' motives are connected to the most true thing that Donald Trump has ever said. And that as many who run these news organizations, they miss Donald Trump, they miss those views. And so just something that I wanna stress with this is be very skeptical of everything you're seeing right now. There's a lot that's real, there's a lot that's fake, there's a lot that's being misconstrued to push whatever narrative someone wants to push for whatever reason. But regarding Biden himself and this NATO summit, he's actually said himself that the summit is a good venue for judging his abilities. And he's pointed to his leadership in rallying NATO support for Ukraine as evidence that he's ready to serve four more years. With him also in a speech kicking off the summit yesterday, really hammering the point home. Make no mistake, Russia is failing in this war. More than two years into Putin's war of choice, his losses are staggering. All of the allies knew that before this war, Putin thought NATO would break. Today, NATO is stronger than it's ever been in its history. So with that, you had outlets like Politico and the New York Times, who, to be clear, haven't hesitated to report on the concerns around Biden's age and mental fitness, noting he was clear and forceful, speaking in a strong voice with few errors. But of course, you know, different people got to watch that speech and come out with very different opinions on the guy's abilities. Which is also why it's notable how Biden's trying to differentiate himself about Trump on more substantive policy matters regarding Ukraine. Right, Trump's known for criticizing NATO member states for not honoring their 2014 commitment to spend 2% of their GDP on defense spending. And back in February, he actually said that he wouldn't provide military protection to any member state that had not met its financial obligations to NATO. If we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. And so while Biden didn't mention Trump by name, he did make a point of saying that the number of NATO member countries that are meeting the 2% target has jumped from nine to 23. He also announced the delivery of new air defenses for Ukraine, along with the Netherlands, Germany, Italy, and Romania, which is big because that is something that Ukraine's been asking for for months, right? I mean, because without them, Russia has been able to hammer the country with airstrikes, right? Like we saw on Monday when Russia launched a deadly strike on a children's hospital in the country. And you know, all of this is happening as people outside of the U.S. understand that there's a lot at stake in this election outside of the country, which is actually something NATO has been trying to get ready for. They're seeing European leaders using the NATO summit to explain the importance of the military alliance to American voters. But this also is they're looking to Trump-proof the alliance. And that, in a number of ways, including by moving control of major elements of military aid to Ukraine away from the U.S. to other parts of NATO. But that said, we're going to have to wait to see how the rest of this summit plays out. And of course, in the meantime, I'd love to know your thoughts. And then, is it me or do the days just seem longer now to you? And I'm not talking about daylight savings. I'm talking about the daily grind, right? It's had me looking for alternative caffeine hits lately, and my wife convinced me that matcha, that'd be a better pick-me-up. And then actually, after trying peak sun goddess matcha for the last few weeks, I've noticed that, you know, I've had more sustainable energy without jitters, caffeine crashes, or anxiety. Which is also why I was so excited to hear that Peak decided to sponsor the PDS. So big thank you to them for that, but also for their sun goddess matcha, which combines slow-release caffeine and catechins, which if you don't know, help curb cravings and support lipid metabolism and L-theanine promoting calm and balance. It's also 100% organic and quadruple toxic screen for pesticides, heavy metals, toxic mold, and radioactive isotopes. And I learned that sun goddess matcha trees are shaded longer to maximize antioxidant L-theanine potential protecting the body from free radicals. Plus, Peak makes it super easy with their pre-measured packs that dissolve in both hot and cold water with a delicious creamy umami flavor. It's perfect for work, home, and on the go. And Peak's sun goddess matcha is the best matcha for performance, energy, and caffeine without the jitters. So get up to 15% off plus a rechargeable frother and cup when you go to peaklife.com slash to or just scan the QR code on the screen. That's up to 15% off with a free rechargeable frother and a cup when you shop at peaklife.com slash DeFranco. And then non-citizen voting. Let's talk about it. Because it's all over the news today thanks to the Republican-controlled House, with them voting on requiring proof of citizenship when registering to vote, which one, follows their efforts to explicitly ban non-citizens from voting in Washington, D.C. and across multiple states. And two, on Monday, the party approved a new draft party platform which demands that proof of citizenship be required when voting. With that, also expected to pass next week at the convention. All of which may make you ask two things. 
Yes. One, isn't this already a thing? And two, if not, why is there all of a sudden out of nowhere a sudden push to require proof of citizenship and bar non-citizens from voting? And to start with the latter there, you know, for Republicans, two major policy points for the party are voting integrity and immigration. On top of that, you know, conservatives see cities like Santa Ana, California, considering allowing non-citizens to vote in local elections and freaking out. With House Speaker Mike Johnson even recently addressing that exact thing while visiting Trump at Mar-a-Lago saying, it could, if there are enough votes, affect the presidential election. We cannot wait for widespread fraud to occur, especially when the threat of fraud is growing with every single illegal immigrant that crosses that border. Then that brings us to your first question, isn't this already illegal? And well, yeah, it is already illegal in federal elections, which the presidential election is, which also ended up being exactly what the Biden administration said when it suggested to House Republicans that Biden would veto their non-citizen voting bill, saying it is already illegal for non-citizens to vote in federal elections. It is a federal crime punishable by prison and fines. Additionally, making a false claim of citizenship or unlawfully voting in an election is punishable by removal from the United States and a permanent bar to admission. States already have effective safeguards in place to verify voters' eligibility and maintain the accuracy of voter rolls. With the Biden administration then going on to say that this bill, it wouldn't make American elections any safer than they already are, and instead it would just make it harder for eligible Americans to vote. Though there, to be fair, the current law only bars non-citizens from voting in federal elections, right? Other elections are left up to the local governments, which is why we've seen Alabama, Colorado, Florida, Louisiana, North Dakota, and Ohio all amending their constitutions to explicitly ban non-citizens from voting. There's also several other states looking at similar amendments. So there, it's also argued that without explicitly banning it, most jurisdictions operate under the assumption that it's just not allowed, which has made it so that voting by non-citizens is extremely rare. And also the idea that illegal aliens get onto voter rolls in very large numbers that has no basis in reality. Some of the best recent data actually coming out of Georgia. After the last election and Trump's accusation of voter fraud, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger conducted an audit of their voter rolls, with them even specifically searching for non-citizens who are registered to vote. What they ended up finding is that in the past 25 years, 1,634 people tried to register, but every single one was caught before getting on the roll. And then also just across the country, it's super fucking rare. Then, you know, there's the issue of non-citizens who are allowed to vote in local elections. And the situation there is that very few jurisdictions allow this. And when they do, it's usually limited to only legal residents and for things like school board and city council. So you have people arguing you could literally put a little marker next to their name on the voting roll that indicates they only get a ballot with campaigns that they're allowed to vote in and the problem's solved. And so it's because of all, or at least some of that, that House Democrats have blasted Republican efforts to pass their non-citizen voting bill. But for example, Representative Joe Morelli saying, it appears the lesson Republicans learned from the fiasco that the former president caused in 2020 was not don't steal an election, it was just start earlier. The coup starts here, this is where it begins. And so what we're seeing here is, you know, it touches on the push and pull the Democrats and Republicans generally have about voting. Democrats generally want as few hurdles as possible in order to ensure as many Americans can vote. But they point out that you already need a social security number or other proof of citizenship when registering to vote. And the bill that's being voted on today, it'll just require additional proof. But the argument being that by forcing someone to produce it again when actually voting, it doesn't actually change anything. Saying all it does is open up the possibility of disenfranchising voters who may have lost their ID or their birth certificate and can't afford to replace it. But then on the other side, you Republicans arguing that this will help secure our elections and boost voter confidence in them. Though others say that that is an issue that they manufactured themselves. But I gotta ask with all this, where do you land on it? What do you think? And then, you know, the problems with kids and their cell phones, it's getting a massive spotlight right now because of this growing trend and the reactions to it. Because while cell phones in school, they, they've been a problem since Zach Morris was whipping out a brick at Bayside High. Where things are now, it's it's very different. And states all over the country are taking action. Most recently, you had the governor of Virginia this week issuing an executive order to limit phone use at public schools in the state. And that order will have the education department come up with a more specific plan on how to do so. And it could also include bans of smartwatches and tablets, with Virginia even devoting half a million dollars to the effort. But this issue, it actually started getting a ton of attention back in June when the Los Angeles Unified School District approved a cell phone ban, with the district announcing in a press release that this is the largest district in the nation to greenlight such a ban and adding, studies have shown that smartphones and social media are distracting kids from learning, eroding their mental health, and stifling in-person social connection. And many who approve this ban noting that phone use goes far above kids just not paying attention. With one board member saying, when I visit campuses during lunchtime, my heart breaks to see students sitting alone isolated on their phones instead of engaging and learning with their peers. And in fact, we're seeing things like California Governor Gavin Newsom supporting cell phone bans in schools in the state and telling Politico that he plans on working with the legislature to restrict their use. And of course, that's notable because California policy isn't just California policy, it can be influential nationwide. And actually on the state level, the assembly already introduced a bill back in February requiring districts to create phone policies, which Newsom does support. Though also notably, Florida was actually the first state to ban phones in schools, but there it varies from school to school how it's enforced, right? 
some banned them by saying phones just have to be in backpacks, which is also why a lot of eyes are on LA because these policies can be more focused at the district level. In LA, I mean, it's a major district with people wondering what kind of tech this ban's going to expand to. Or will the students have to lock their phones away? Will the school just block access to social media? What are the logistics? Though there, even though LA would be the biggest district to make this move, there are plenty of other schools that they can turn to for examples. Right, different schools have taken different approaches to phone bans. Some have their students put their phones in storage cubbies during class, though perhaps the biggest new trend is phone locking bags. But in fact, NBC News reporting that in 2023, schools in 41 states had invested in these bags, which you may be familiar with if you've gone to like concerts or comedy shows in the past few years. Most are made by a company called Yonder and you put your phone in the pouch, you lock it, you carry it around with you during the day. And then at the end, you take the bag to a magnetic unlocking base and you're free to scroll again. And their popularity in classrooms has become an increasingly hot topic, especially because you have teachers saying after COVID, phones become bigger problems in schools, saying it's no longer like kids just texting under their desks. In fact, you had one principal turned superintendent in Massachusetts telling the Washington Post that students are just full ass watching YouTube videos in class. They're refusing to put their phones away, which is why in 2021, she decided to bring these lock pouches in and not long after neighboring districts did the same. And reportedly, many who have tried this have found it very effective. With, for example, the vice principal at a middle school in Manchester, Connecticut, telling the Post that social media was increasing conflict among students. But after the students began using lock bags, those conflicts died down and things like bathroom vaping sessions, they stopped because kids couldn't coordinate. And even though there, the, the kids protested at first, a lot have gotten over it. With one even telling the Post that it's nice that she can focus in class. Sometimes she even forgets her phone's on her. And you had an eighth grader saying that the halls and the cafeteria, they're louder now because people are actually talking to each other in person. Some students saying they've actually now made more friends. And that middle school, right, they're not an outlier. You had the Akron Education Association in Ohio telling Vox that after getting lock bags, fights decrease. Also a Colorado principal telling Time Magazine that students are less worried about what their peers are saying about them online behind their backs. And this is a phenomenon that we're seeing in other parts of the world as well. I mean, a study from Norway found that in middle schools with general phone bans, girls had fewer specialist care visits for mental health issues. Also noticing that bullying went down for both boys and girls. But with all that said, you know, there are still people that are very skeptical about hyper strict bans. With the conversation, for example, saying there just aren't enough studies and hard evidence to actually prove the benefits. Right, a lot of what we've talked about, it seems anecdotal. And you have the matting that students need to learn how to use phones responsibly, not be fully detached from them. And notably regarding LA, the LA Times spoke to a board member who's not sold on the bans. With them arguing that instead the schools need to respect a student's ownership of something important to them. And this is the Times also pointed to the burden of enforcing these bans. And then even when it comes to the yonder lock bags, students at some schools have just found ways around them or broken into them. And others noting that there are dozens of anti-yonder petitions on change.org, some calling them a waste of money, arguing that it should be up to the teachers on how phones are used in the classroom. But then also, of course, you have people worried about safety. Our parents want to be able to contact their children in the event of an emergency, whether your normal universal emergencies or the ones that we almost specifically only see in America. We have school officials in charge of these policies saying they have answers for most of these questions. With Raymond Dolphin, for example, the assistant principal at the Connecticut Middle School saying that if a shooting did happen, students need to focus on hiding and staying quiet, explaining. The whole idea that you want every kid to be taking out a phone and calling parents is the exact opposite of the safety program. Protocols. And telling the Post that for other general emergencies, teachers can call 911 on their phones and most classrooms have a landline regardless. And on top of that, if shit really hit the fan, you could cut the bag open if you had to. And then when it comes to family emergencies, right, parents can contact the school's office to get in touch with the students. And there are also often medical exemptions for students who might have their phones for their health reasons. And this is you have teachers saying, you know, we know that some kids have found a way around the pouch. But saying even still, if enough kids have their phones locked, students feel less incentivized to use them. And then as far as the argument of needing to treat kids like adults, you had Washington Post columnist Kate Cohen writing, how can we possibly prepare students to battle technology that is designed to be addictive? Adults can't resist them either. One principal compares it with giving a kid a cigarette and saying, here, be responsible. Which is also, you know, a funny aspect of this debate because in it, no one is arguing that phones are not a problem, both generally and with young people and with schools. I mean, one study found that students receive 237 phone notifications a day and many while in class. And back in June, I mean, we talked about this, the US Surgeon General urged for social media platforms to have warnings about the harms they could pose to youth mental health. Or right, something akin to what you see on tobacco and alcohol. But now with all that said and painted for you, I gotta pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? Are you for the bans? Are you against them? If you're for the bans, what does that look like? I don't know, I'm really interested. Then finally today to take the show back from filling another shirt and haircut, I wanna to close today out with a congratulations and also I wanna talk about yesterday. Starting with a congratulations to Walter T who just won our weekly $500 giveaway towards his choice of SeatGeek tickets. With Walter saying he's using his winnings to hit up a Dallas Cowboys game to, which I gotta say, Walter, why you gotta do that? You know they're just gonna make you cry in the postseason. Though I don't even know what the playoffs feel like. I'm a Jets and Chargers fan, but that was just a conversation 
conversation for me and Walter. For everyone else, just a reminder, that's right. SeatGeek and The Daily Dip are still giving away up to $1,000 in tickets, and you should definitely enter today if you haven't already. Right, you just add code PDS to your SeatGeek app profile for a chance at the weekly $500 prize, no purchase necessary. And when $1,000 prizes are available to Daily Dip subscribers who add code PDS newsletter, doubling entries and winnings. But then finally, uh, let's talk about yesterday's show because a lot of the comments, y'all like when Angry Phil comes out too much. And yeah, he has a way with words and I love him a little bit. But I generally try to keep that guy locked in the basement. But I'm glad you guys got entertained. And uh, this time when he came out, it was uh, during an opportune time rather than me stubbing my toe and me just taking out like nine months of anger out on some drywall. But yeah, as far as the rest of the comments, a lot of the conversation was about sketch and that whole outing. But unsurprisingly, the vast majority of people on Sketch's side, proper bird saying the people saying Sketch lied to them are especially weird. Unless you're in a relationship with him, he doesn't owe anyone a background check on his sexual history. And Seiko adding, they're the same person who say, I don't care who you sleep with, just keep it to yourself. And then when someone did keep it to themselves and hide it from them, suddenly you lied to us. You should have told us from the beginning if you're gay. Like which one is it, Kevin? With many just noting that Sketch made them laugh. Quote, I did not have sexual relations with that man. I'm just kidding, I did. Is absolutely iconic from Sketch. I also saw Telio say people more mad at Sketch for having a gay video and not mad at Dr. Disrespect for literally talking sexually to a child is wild. Though there, I have to ask, was that actually happening? Because I could only find comments of people saying that was happening, but I didn't see them. I'm not saying that that's not the case. If it was, that's insane. Even if people were drawing comparisons, that's insane. Especially because as people who aren't even familiar with Sketch were saying, or with Seamus saying, I can't say I've ever heard of the Sketch until this evening, but when Phil presented the story, my reaction was, why is this a story? As long as Sketch and whoever else in the videos were consenting adults, they have nothing to be ashamed of. They didn't commit any crimes. We all have done things that we regret and we just have to learn from our mistakes. That's part of growing up. With him then adding, frankly, we should, if anything, be jealous of Sketch or having friends and family that give him love and support to remind him that he didn't do anything wrong and they'll be with him no matter what. But then finally, to everyone saying, uh, please make your fast, but you're not faster than a Google search, a t-shirt. Why would you wear that? We've spent so much time making like the perfect cut and sew, so it's just like the best fucking shirt you could possibly wear at an affordable price. And when we put designs on things, there's like thought and effort put into most of them. So I just gotta ask, in what setting does you wearing that shirt make sense? But yeah, still, uh, fuck Tyreek Hill, that woman beater. Uh, but that is uh, actually how we're gonna end today's show. I hope you feel filled in on this Wednesday evening, Thursday morning dive into the news. And uh, the good thing, you don't have to miss my stupid face for too long, because I'll be right back here tomorrow to talk more news with you.